Psalm 15 is a pretty short psalm. It was a psalm that I read for quite some time, and it troubled me. Because it poses a question in the very first verse. And as I read through the following verses, it made me even more concerned. Because let me, let me tell you, for the simple reason, I didn't measure up. And it really troubled me as a young Christian. And I wanted to have a look at it tonight because... This morning was different. We have a different crowd. And uh, I, I really wanted to, to be very straightforward. I want to be straightforward this evening, but it's a different tone to what is a different audience. So let, let me read the 15th Psalm. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary... Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slayer on his fellow man, who despises a vile man, but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. The 15th Psalm is concerned with the conditions by which a man or woman, a boy or girl for that matter, may dwell with God. And uh, that's a really searching a kind of question as far as I'm concerned because as a believer, I want the assurance that I am not only living close to God, but that God has a place in his place for me. But yet as I read this psalm, it, it disturbed me because I could see that the standards were exceedingly high. This particular psalm, as you read it, is especially noteworthy because it unites religion, if I could call it that, and morality in a yoke of partnership. They're like the two oxen under the yoke. They're together together. And it's important that they're pointed in the same way and they go the same way in coordination and unison. And the psalm opens up with a question. And then thankfully, at least you might say thankfully, but if you're really thinking about it, you might have more problems with the answer than the question, at least initially, if you didn't understand. But it opens up with a question, and then it continues with an answer to the question posed, and then, thankfully, it concludes with what I've called the cherry on the top. And that cherry goes beyond the original question. So you see it yourself in verse 1. That's the question posed. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? Now, God's holy hill was without doubt Jerusalem. And that's one of the things about the Old Testament. You do have to have a certain understanding as to the background. And uh, God's holy hill was without doubt Jerusalem. And his sanctuary, I, I think I can say without fear of, of any objection, that it was most likely the tent or the tabernacle which housed the Ark of the Covenant before Solomon built the temple. And many commentators actually express the opinion that Psalm 15 actually refers to the occasion when David brought the ark from the house of Obed-Edom to Mount Zion, and he placed it in the tent that he himself had prepared, prepared for it. And you read uh, about that in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and also in the book of, of Deuteronomy. But Psalm 15 outlines 
the moral challenge. And that's why I, I get angsty, you know, because I know everybody here thinks I'm the most moral person you could ever meet. But as my son reminds me, if you want to see a sinner, you just have to look in the mirror. And that's very challenging. Psalm 15 outlines the challenge which God's presence in their midst presented in the context of the psalm to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And more so, this psalm, else I wouldn't be doing it tonight because that era is long gone. We do not have a tabernacle. We do not have a temple. We do not live in what is today Israel. It has a wider application, and that's important. That's why we're taking the time tonight to have a look at it because it inquires into the terms in which any human being, and may I make that point, whether you're, you're a full-grown adult man or woman or whether you're a boy or girl, this is something people seem to, they don't understand. To listen to some people, you would think that there was a different basis on which children entered the kingdom of God as opposed to adults. But the standards in the way is exactly the same whether you're five years of age or whether you're 75 years of age. But, you know, it's not just got to do with this life. What bothers me most is it's also concerned not just about this life, but also in the life to come. I'm very concerned about the life to come. If for no other reason, if you live to be 100 in this world, it's not even a drop in the ocean to the next world because it's eternal. And we have got to be sure that our standing with God is going to go beyond this lifetime. And the psalm writer is clear that the Lord is a holy God. And what's clear in this psalm and others is that sinners separate themselves from God by their sin. And if you're in any doubt about that, verse 4 makes that clear. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil, with you, the wicked cannot dwell. Well, if that's the way things are, give me the answer, will you? Yes, I'm concerned, and the question bothers me. But I've often said this to people. You know, I was doing my finals in university and people asked me, hey, were, were the questions hard? And I said, no, the questions weren't hard, but the answers were, were really difficult. <laughs> and that's the way it is here. The question's easy to understand. It couldn't be more straightforward. It's the answer that poses us the, 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 the need to think. But the psalm writer thankfully answers his own question in verses 2 through 6 by describing the kind of person who may draw near to God. And that's lovely because if you're like, I love, well, I was going to say I love cartoons. I don't really because I don't look at them too much. But I'm inclined to think in cartoon terms. I think in pictures when I'm trying to understand something, I try to create a mental picture of what's being addressed in the story or, or, or in the issue. And that helps me to kind of stand back and look at, 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 at the picture, the mental picture. And the picture that the psalmist paints is an attractive one. I mean, it's a very attractive one. Indeed, let me tell you, and this was the cause of the trouble to me in my own mind and soul, because if you read that as I did, there is no one, absolutely no one, who has perfectly fulfilled this ideal except the man, Christ Jesus. I haven't. And if you say you think you have, I will give you my response you're gravely mistaken. And, and that's what makes the, the psalm such a, a tempting one to try to get your head around. The Lord Jesus alone has entered the presence of God in heaven by virtue of his own merit. He is the only one. But therein lies a wonderful hint 
and clue and a wonderful source of peace and rest because that underlines for us that access to God is possible, but it's possible only through the Lord Jesus. And that's the message of the New Testament explicitly. It is contained in the Old Testament, but not explicitly so. You could read the Old Testament as people in that era and age did, but when Jesus Christ came, there were virtually, there were few, if any, who actually realized who he was, what he was and who he was. That, that, that's why, the, I mean, if everybody, if, oh my goodness me, that's, that's the Messiah. Let's work. But they, they didn't. His coming and, and the nature of his coming and the way of his birth and the life that he lived and the people that he hung out with, uh, not that he hung out, pe people seem to think he hangs out with sinners and people like that habitually. Yes, he did. Because sinners, this is something people don't always understand. When you read that word sinners in the Gospels, it doesn't mean drug addicts, you know, prostitutes, people who are dyed in the wool of thieves. It means ordinary people. The sinners were the people who didn't have the resources to separate their, their lives so that they could put themselves under the tutelage of, of a rabbi. They, they neither had the time nor the resources, so they, they lacked that formal kind of education and, and religious standing. And, and so the Pharisees and the religious uh, echelon of people described them as sinners. Now, of course, that included some of what you might call the, the low-life kind of people, but it included everyone and anyone who wasn't formally trained and who hadn't set themselves apart to follow the law in every jot and tittle and who never, ever could, but they fooled themselves into thinking that they were the ones who were doing it. He answers his own question. And the picture he paints is an attractive one. It does point us to the Lord Jesus. It's looking in the mirror. You know, I hate that, don't you? I mean, it's all right for Ryan. He's young, he's muscular, he's handsome. You know, he's dark hair, it's all there. You know, he's just a great guy. He looks in the mirror in the morning, he probably smiles at himself and says, aren't I a handsome hunk? And if Hillary hears him, she says, yeah, you are, Ryan. But for the larger number of us here, can I tell you, I never look in the mirror when I get out of the shower before I put on my dressing gown. I'm not kidding. I'm serious when I say that because I'll tell you what, it ain't a pretty sight. And, and that's what we need to do as people. We really need to be honest with ourselves and look in the mirror and realize that however nice we are and however faithful we are, even in the 21st century, in our church observations, that, that will never cut it. And that's the best lesson that you can learn because that is the entrance into freedom and liberty. And that's one of the chief reasons why I can stand here week after week and say the things I say to you that perhaps, well, I know undoubtedly provoke some people. But I know I can say that to you because you're exactly the same as me. And so I have to keep reminding you, look, don't look at me, look at Jesus. Yes, I'm following Jesus. But for goodness sake, don't examine me too closely. But you can examine Jesus and you'll not see a crack or a hair out of place in the Lord Jesus Christ. Other Christians, and this is a lesson you would do well to learn, I'm sure the majority have, never, never put your faith in another Christian and look up to them. My grandfather was my mentor in many ways. But one day he said to me, because he knew where I was, he said, Stuart, I know you love me and you think I'm a marvelous Christian. He said, but don't look to me. The longer you know me and the better you get to know me, you will see the cracks and the crevices and I shall inevitably disappoint you. Don't look at me. Look at Jesus. He will never disappoint you. And that's a what I hope there's nobody here who's doing that with any human being. 
But the picture he paints here is an attractive one. And it was fulfilled only in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's by being brought near to God through the Lord Jesus that we can enjoy continuing fellowship with him. James Blaze gave us uh, testimony this morning and he, he did really well because it was very, very clear. And, and essentially he told us that there was a time in his life, he was a little boy and he tried to do the right thing and as far as a little boy was concerned, it all seemed so right. But then when he got into his teenage years, he realized that he was making a mess of his life and he wasn't in any way following Jesus Christ and he had to come and he had to admit his sin to God and he had to ask God to forgive him and Jesus to be his saviour. And, 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 and that's where we need to be. That, you know, that's step one. And the funny thing is, it's, it, it's, it's, it's that that sets the pattern for our enjoyment of continuing fellowship with God. You'd be surprised. I meet people who attend this church and they come as often as, as anyone else. But when I speak to them, their idea of God is, 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 is totally out of whack. They think that, well, their parents came to church and they were brought up to come to church and they wouldn't miss it for anything. But they're living lives as slaves. As slaves. That's what John Wesley told the Moravian brothers. He was on his way to Georgia over on the Atlantic coast to, to, to preach Christ to the Indians and save them. On his trip over the boat, which wasn't like the, the cruise ships that we have today, you know, it was probably about 80 feet long and made entirely out of wood. And they hit a storm. And, and, and Wesley was very, very concerned. And he could see this circle of Moravian brothers standing in the midship, holding hands and rejoicing in God. And, and he, was, he was so convicted. And he spoke to them afterwards. He was so moved by their courage. And he said, after speaking with them and witnessing their response, I realized that they were sons of God. And I was a slave. My religion was a religious of trying to please God and trying to win his approval. Their religion was one of relationship. God was their father who loved them and they were his sons. And there's quite a difference. And the saddest thing for me as a pastor is you would be surprised how many people will congregate in churches and that is the difference. And they have no joy. And they have no sense of liberty or freedom in the Lord because they're still captive. And they're trying to please God in every way. Please him so that they can reach the standard. And it's a sad thing. We can enjoy fellowship with God through Christ. That's a given. But if only by his grace we lead the kind of holy life which the psalm describes. And I'm not sure if you got this as I read it, but it is very challenging because it's so very simple and straightforward. What does a psalm writer say? He tells us it's essentially a social holiness. I mean it concerns largely our duty to our neighbor or our fellows, if you like. And, 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 and through reading the New Testament, I know how that is. Because how can we claim to have a right relationship with God without having a right relationship with fellow human beings? I mean, isn't that a given? Both in the Old Testament, as it's further enunciated in the New. And it follows then that we can't expect, I can't expect, you can't expect to dwell in God's presence if we are not seeking our neighbor's good. Now, you don't know my neighbor, do you? 
but just thank God you don't live beside him. So the people who enjoy God's company are described in verse 2 as blameless. Now that doesn't mean to say that they're without fault. What it means, blameless is something, you can't blame someone for something they're not aware of or something that's not intentional. But what it means is this, they're people of such integrity of character that they both seek to do what is right and to speak what is true. And further, the truth they speak, and this is perhaps this is the most important thing of all, the truth they speak is from their heart, for they always mean what they say. I mean, how can you have a relationship with anyone who tell you things and they don't mean it? It's impossible. How, how could you exist in a marriage if the person that you are in marriage to refuses to be open and honest and tell you what they mean. I mean, there's just no future in it. You can't have a relationship. And subsequently, these people that the psalmist talks about are people who are consistent in thought and word and deed. And, and there's a wonderful, wonderful maxim to have for your life that we should be consistent in thought and word and deed. And I can tell you, someone who tries, it's the hardest thing in the world. You know, I, my church in England was founded by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And his successor at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, where he was the preacher for decades, was the first pastor in my church. His son was the second pastor. And I think I've read everything he's written. I have 62 volumes of his sermons, and there's over 800 pages in, in, in every volume. But Spurgeon said on one occasion, someone challenged him because of his inconsistency. And his answer was, well, who am I that I should be consistent with myself? And his point being that the only one who is truly consistent is God himself. Even Spurgeon was, was admitting to his fault that there were inconsistencies in his life. In particular, the comment was made with regard to his, his preaching. These people are consistent in thought, word, and deed. They're not without sin. It's not that they're getting it 100% every right, but there's a consistency and an integrity. And the psalm writer's positive statement, he now illustrates it by negative examples, and sometimes that's the best way to do it, by negative example. He says, this, this isn't the way you're supposed to be. You know how, how people do that. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if you want to know how to be uh, living close with God, uh, don't follow that. Do something different. And indeed, it's against these negatives that the positive excellence of good people stands out. Please don't be offended, but some uh, don't be offended at all, because I understand the practical reasons why this happens. But there are many people who complain to me, and they say, "Man, you know, when I was a minister in Georgia, and I told them I was leaving to come here, they thought I'd gone crazy." Pastor, you're Irish, and I know you don't know, but those people on the left coast are crazies. It's the best move my wife and I ever made. Where better to shine as in a place where it's dark? Isn't that the truth? Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light, like a little candle shining in the night. He looks down from heaven to see us shine, you in your small corner and I in mine. 
What a wonderful joy to be a light in a dark place. And the darker the place, the brighter your witness shines, even if it's not a perfect witness. Further, notice first of all in the verses, verse 3 is what I'm thinking of right now. They don't harm their neighbors by anything they say or do. They neither slander them nor wrong them. They don't cast slurs against them. And I, I, as someone who has some knowledge of the original languages, that casting of slurs means they don't repeat gossip about their neighbors. Gossip is a dreadful, dreadful sin. Nor do they take unfair advantage of their neighbors when their neighbors are experiencing adversity. Can you imagine anything lower than that? So the psalm writer's saying is, here's what these people do. Don't you be like that. Then second in verse 4, he said they are discerning in their judgment or their assessment of others. They're not afraid to express disappointment of worthless people. Yeah, that's a lesson we could do well to learn. Verse 4, who despises a vile man. Sometimes we need to exercise that and call a spade a spade. Sometimes the best way to help someone get on track is to tell it like it is and not to be gullible. Now we always speak the truth in love and you always pick your time and you don't go about telling virtual strangers about their vileness. But then thirdly, they're faithful to their promises. And he adds a caveat even when it's, their own, it's their, to their own inconvenience and disadvantage. In other words, verse 5, they're people of their word. They let their yea be yea and their nay be nay. You know, that's a, that, that is a delight. To be around people who tell you like it is, and when they say something, you know you can take it to the bank. What a disappointment and how frustrating it is when you're dealing with people and they will tell you one thing and then they, they, they won't come up. Oh yeah, I'll be there. So you're preparing yourself and you're there and you're looking around. It happens. Then fourthly in verse 6, they never exploit the poor or oppress the innocent. And he's very explicit in this. He says, more precisely, they, they're not like the money lenders who, who charge exorbitant interest and take you to the cleaners. Or they're not like the magistrates or, or judgments or, or judges who, who will swing things your way if you give them a bribe. They're not crooked or corrupted or alloyed in any way. What a sad thing to think that so much of that goes on. Those particular practices were forbidden throughout the Old Testament. In fact, they were considered despicable. Then verse 7. That contains the assertion of the psalm writer, or as I said, the cherry on top. Because he began by asking, who may dwell in God's presence? And he answered his own question by painting a picture of a person, if you want to boil it down to what it boils down to, who loves his or her neighbor. But he or she doesn't stop there. Because such people, the psalm writer concludes, and, and again, this is the cherry on the cake. The man or woman, boy or girl, who lives life like that, will not only abide in God's presence, they will never be shaken. 
That's the importance of a clean, the importance of a clean life. That's the importance of, of, of proper relationships between human beings, especially the people who are closest to you. And the psalmist says, not only will you dwell in God's presence, but you'll never be shaken. And, and how that applies is this, and it applies to us in the 21st century as much to those a thousand years ago. On the contrary, they will remain firm and secure throughout all the vicissitudes of this life. And what's more important to me and the life to come. Because that's what takes up a lot of my thought. I think about the life to come and I try to visualize what it will be like because I want to be sure that when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And I've told you this before, but my granddad said to me, or asked me the question, what do you think heaven will be like, Stuart? And of course, as a little boy, my idea was a great big marble staircase leading upwards. And on the bottom of the staircase and the bowl of strods, there was two beautiful bowls of fruit. Great and bananas and melons and pineapples and all of that. Things that we could not get in Ireland. We'd only seen in pictures or we're told about at school. And my grandfather said to me, Stuart, it'll be a million times better than that. And that put to rest a young child's mind. But even now, at my age, and having been a pastor for all these years, I just encourage myself by knowing that the life to come will be greater by far than my wildest imaginations about what it might be like. Greater than my best, most vivid imaginations. So, brothers and sisters, who may dwell in the, on the hill or the house of God. Who might have a relationship and room with God? It's the man or woman, boy or girl, who is blameless. It's the man or woman who conducts a right relationship with their neighbors so that he or she speaks the truth and speaks what they say and say what they mean and does not slur and slander and gossip about other people because religion is worthless unless it works itself out in a horizontal fashion. And all through the Old Testament and the New Testament we are told the importance that if we claim to be religious we'll remember the widow and the orphan for example and we'll visit the sick and those in prison. It has this human outworking. How can you say you love a brother if you see him in need and you don't attempt to at least alleviate in some way that need? So much of our faith and our Christianity comes down to that. And instead of thinking the worst about a person, looking for, for some vestige of, of, of positive that you can celebrate and, 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 and use as a catalyst to inspire and draw even more good stuff out and in the person. There's a lot to think about there. But I close by reminding you of this. There isn't one of us who can live up to that psalm 100%. Not one of us will ever be able to merit a room in God's house. The only one who was able to do that was God's son, the Lord Jesus. And we are old enough and wise enough to know that we come to the Father through the Son. And it's through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for our sins. He made himself a sacrifice for our sins. And by his blood, we are made clean. And that's the way through. But if we claim to be followers of Jesus and trusting in him, then there will be an ethical and moral outworking in our lives. And if there isn't, 
Well, it could be we're fakes. And it would be worth our while going back and looking around the foundations of our claim to faith. And that's not a bad thing. I am not afraid to admit it. There are times in my life, it appears, when I have been given to doubts. And I take my grandfather's advice. He said, Stuart, you need to look around the foundations of your faith. What is it that you're claiming or trusting in as regards your relationship with God? And that's always helpful. Because I can tell you tonight, and I think you can stand with me. The only thing is this. Trusting in the Lord Jesus, the life that he has lived. And the sacrifice that he has made for our sin. And then when you come into that wonderful, wonderful understanding. And that nothing short but faith. The spirit of God comes into our lives. Because he's the one who birthed us into the family of God. And it's he who leads us. And gives us the grace and the strength to glorify the Lord Jesus in the lives that we live. And to have our mind and understanding transformed and conformed to Jesus' model. And I don't believe in any shape or form in salvation by works. But I do believe with James that faith without works is dead. And the farce and the fake think about the 15th psalm and I hope that has been a, a nice little introduction for you to it. Father in heaven, thank you for all your goodness to us. Your word is marvelous. Uh, Father, we need the spirit of God to help us to understand what you have caused to be written. And what you have caused to be written, Lord God, is for our inspiration and our education and instruction. Yes, Lord, and for our correction and rebuke too. Because your word is what leads us in righteousness and what helps us, O oh God, to live a life that brings glory to the Lord Jesus, that helps us to be a little candle in the darkness. And so we thank you for the light within, for the love of God, for the grace of God, and for that wonderful relationship that we have with you, that the Lord Jesus Christ has introduced us to. Blessed be his name, now and forevermore.